recording. Is that working? Welcome students, faculty, staff, family, and friends to the 2020 Nursing Light the Lamp ceremony at the University of Texas at Austin School of Nursing. Some 170 years ago, uh, Florence Nightingale used her lamp as a beacon in the night to comfort and guide the wounded in military hospitals. Her light has blazed a path of service that, that continues uh, through the centuries and nurses who have followed in her footsteps. Today, our Light the Lamp celebrates the flame of Florence Nightingale's legacy. And I want you to reflect for a moment on some of the key themes of her legacy. You all are new to nursing, but you've come a very long way already, and I know these themes will be familiar to you. These include the use of evidence, what we might call research today, ventilation, clean air, and how important that was, and of course, in the time of COVID-19, ventilation also takes on, you know, the ability to breathe as well. Uh, personal and household cleanliness. Patient observation, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Proper management of the environment. We spend a lot of time on that these days. And advocacy. Most importantly, I think, Florence Nightingale taught those first trained nurses, and that's what they called them trained, not educated, but trained uh, in those days. And she taught them the skills and habits of observation and assessment, including what and how to observe and how to report facts rather than opinion. And I know that you've spent a good bit of time learning these skills this summer as well. So today we symbolically take up our own lanterns of compassionate, competent caring each in our own way to more brightly walk our path of service to the world. Through humanistic, patient-centered care, let us be the keepers of that flame and emphasize a value that has been in the center of what we teach at the University of Texas at Austin School of Nursing. You are our 10th group of students who will take an oath to provide compassionate care prior to beginning your clinical experiences at the school. But you are the first group of students who will take specifically the Nightingale Pledge to provide high quality and compassionate care. The lamp lighting ceremony formally recognizes the student's entry into the nursing profession. As part of today's ceremony, you will each receive a specially designed pen for nursing students to serve as a visual reminder of your commitment as a nurse to provide competent and compassionate care. And I wanna emphasize over and over the importance of those two things being paired together. The competence that is part of your education, your skills, your knowledge, and that blended with compassion. One by itself is not about professional nursing. It's the blend of those two together. You will also receive a tea light as a symbol of the lamp and knowledge. By having the School of Nursing host today's Light the Lamp ceremony, I am reiterating to you, Longhorn nursing students, two important messages. First, that that competent and compassionate care is the hallmark of excellent clinical practice. Again, both skill and knowledge and compassion being essential. Second, that we at the School of Nursing take great pride in having you represent us as part of Longhorn Nursing as you embark on your clinical experiences. This event is not only a ceremony, but also a celebration. A celebration of the high quality, skilled healthcare and service that you as a Longhorn Nursing students provide to the community. We are so pleased to have one of our outstanding faculty members, Dr. Anna Todd, to provide the keynote for today's ceremony. Dr. Todd is a strong exemplar of the very intelligent and compassionate care that we are recognizing today. Dr. Todd.
Good morning. Oh my. Oh my. I just mean, sorry, I started speaking Spanish. Today, this is a wonderful, this is a really special occasion for all of you. And um, so today I'm going to talk about compassionate care, which is a cornerstone of nursing. So over the summer, uh, you've learned in theory what it means to be a nurse. And I know this has been a really, really long summer, right? Yeah, it's okay. It's, it's done, right? And now you're going to be able to provide nursing care at the bedside and in the community. You'll be applying what we call the science and art of nursing. So today I'm gonna to focus on the art of nursing through compassionate care. The dictionary definition of compassion is as follows, quote, sympathetic consciousness of others, just others distress together with a desire to alleviate it, unquote. So when I asked the majority of my five children to define compassion and compassionate care, these were the following comments. Well, compassion is when you put yourself in the place of the person who is in need of help and take action to make it better. It is not just sympathy. It is when you feel empathetic towards your patient, you meet them where they are, and then do something that will help them be independent. That was my then 21-year-old political science major. Compassionate care is when you notice the gentleman who's been wearing the same dirty socks for a week in rehab, and you ask him if he wants a fresh pair of socks. That's the daughter who's an OT. Compassion is walking around in someone else's shoes so you can help them. That's my nurse daughter. Compassion is gentle. Kind, sympathy, compassionate care is when you take the time to engage in your patient. It's the little things you do. That's my lawyer son. I chose not to interview my oldest son because he's a financial advisor and you never know what move he's going to be in. <laughs> so from my small survey, I was able to get the sense that compassionate care and compassion can have slightly different meanings, but consistent is the notion that compassion is a sentiment that serves as a catalyst that fuels action, a caring action. Compassion and compassionate care is the core of the element, it's a core element in nursing. In fact, compassion is so essential to nursing, we put it in the very first provision in the ANA Code of Ethics. I always, I always laugh because my name is Anna, and I tell my students when they teach ethics that no, it's not my Code of Ethics, it's the American Nurses Association of Ethics. Uh, so it's the provision number one, which was updated in 2015. And it says, quote, the nurse practices with compassion and respect for the inherent dignity, worth, and unique attributes of every person. So what does compassionate care look like? Who's ever spent time in a hospital? Okay. And or knows of somebody else who has. So I can tell you from personal experience as a patient of, with two back surgeries, I recall that most of the nurses would just widen the room light up. They'd say, on a, on a scale of one to 10, what is your pain level? And I felt like saying 4.6258. Not one nurse 
would stand there or ask, how are you today? Except for one. There was one nurse that would, that literally she just, she was an older seasoned nurse. She was actually a faculty person, uh, instructor. And she pulled up a chair and she actually sat down and she put her hand on my hand and asked, how are you? I hadn't heard those words. I didn't know what they sounded like. I almost want to say, wait, are you actually talking to me? And oh, are you willing to touch me? Which I know right now, this is different times. I was so grateful for her compassionate care that day. Why? Because she recognized that I was in need of support. She took the time. She spoke to me, not at me. And most importantly, she was present. Present. Being there. She was being there for comfort. So another example of compassionate care was given to me by one of my friends who's a, actually graduated from the CNS program here. She is actually blind. Um, she wasn't completely blind when she was in the program, but she specializes in, ger in the geriatric population. And she was a care manager. And she was taking care of a um, 90 year old man who had fallen and uh, was taken to the hospital. She received a call from his wife who was too sick to come to the hospital. And then she was actually admitted to the hospital on the same floor as her husband. So the two of them have net, had never spent time away from each other, and his wife was dying. But he was too weak to see her, even, even in, in a wheelchair. So my, my nurse friend, being an ad, patient advocate, was very creative. She said, okay, well, I'm going to the ER. I'm going to ask the nurses. I'm going to say, if we can get one of the ER gurneys and bring it up to the floor and have him spend time with his wife. Well, at first, you can imagine, oh, no way, you're not taking any equipment from the ER. Well, after a while, they agreed. And so she brought the gurney up, put him on it, and then brought him to her so they would be at the same level so he could say his last goodbyes to his wife. That's compassion. Taking the time, making a difference. Okay. So... Those are just some examples. Um, and I've also, I teach public health practicum, and I've had the privilege, it really is a privilege, of watching my undergraduate nursing students in public health. And I know you all have taken public health, right? Not yet, not yet, okay. Um, so I, they had, I had the pleasure, privilege of watching my students engage in different uh, populations and listening to women experiencing homelessness and being that, being present, giving, looking at the person and seeing the human, He's seeing the human in front of them. So these are just a few examples of compassionate care. A manif it's a manifestation of the art of nursing. Walk around in your patient's shoes, is what I used to tell my students. Empathize with them. And most of all, act on it so that you may help patients maintain their independence and their dignity. See the human being in front of you. I'd like to add that while you're practicing compassion, you need to practice self-compassion. You probably have heard people say, how can you take care of others if you don't take care of yourself? Right now, that's especially important, right? Most of us choose nursing as a profession to nurture and care others. And many of us in this profession ignore our own self-care. Raise your hand if you ignore your own self-care. Okay. And we fail to engage in self-compassion. Kristen Neff, she's a renowned expert in self-compassion and a professor here at the University of Texas at Austin. She defines self-compassion as, quote, a self-attitude that involves treating oneself with warmth 
in understanding in difficult times and recognizing that making mistakes is part of being human or human. She goes on to say that being self-compassion is treating yourself in the same way you would treat a good friend when you're having a hard time. You fail or notice something you don't like about yourself by being supportive and loving. So remember, while you're busy making a difference in your patients' lives, and I undoubtedly know you will, please take time to mindfully shower yourself with self-compassion and know that you're not supposed to be perfect. Florence Nightingale, the lady of the land, was in the embodiment of compassion and our role model for compassionate care for her. She was named the lady of the land because of her reputation of carrying the lamp in the darkness to attend to suffering soldiers in the Crimean War. The lamp symbolizes the light that we bring to nurses as our suffering patients at the bedside in the community. This light is the hope we give to patients through compassionate care. Remember to embrace the privilege that we have as nurses to make a difference. Now more than ever, I ask you to carry the lamp and be the light in the world. Today marks the celebration into your opportunity to become one of the countless nurses who are passionate about compassionate care. Go forth and carry the land. I do have a poem that I usually read, but it's too long, so I will post it. I will have them post it because it's very long. So, okay. Come on, here's Dr. Todd. Thank you, Dr. Todd. I have a lot of my first. Okay. So, Dr. Todd came straight from class just to, just to be in this event with us. So, we're always glad to have her. Thank you, Dr. Todd, for your inspirational talk. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Vin Nguyen. I'm the Assistant Dean for Student Services. Do you remember me? First day of orientation. I congratulate you on your milestone to getting into the University of Texas in Austin. And now today, I get to be up front of you to congratulate you on your milestone today and getting ready to uh, go and practice competent compassionate care uh, and, uh, and get started on your campus. Uh, so congratulations uh, again. Uh, also, congratulations that uh, normally when we have this event, uh, I would be the one who calls your name in, in person. Uh, but because of COVID-19, you're lucky. I don't have to do that. You don't have to give me to pronounce uh, your name. Uh, instead, what we'll do is we'll make sure we'll have an individual announcement for you. Uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the, the video. Uh, and also, Dr. Laura uh, Murphy, she's going to call your name instead, right? Uh, to come up and then, uh, so that you can be on front of the camera in front of your families. And, uh, and you do a, a self uh, penning. This will add some additional time to the recording uh, and also to the folks at home, which I managed by. But uh, yeah, we think it's going to be really uh, worth it. Um, so many of you might know that in the past, this used to be called uh, White Coat, right? And so that was in uh, around 2014 when it first got started. As we, as we go further and further into doing this and providing more emphasis on nursing, we decided to call it uh, Light uh, the Lamp. So this, uh, as I just said, this is our really, very first time of doing Light the Lamp and then changing the whole to even more focus uh, on nursing. Also in the past, uh, we didn't have a student speaker, so afterwards when we finished talking, everybody was just really scared and wondering what the heck was gonna be next. I just came more and more scared. But what we did was we decided to add in a student speaker uh, for you, just uh, an AE who had been gone through this uh, uh, before, just to share with you uh, their experience. 
uh, and, and to, in a way, help you uh, mentally uh, for it. So today we have Bianca Schmidt, who um, will speak to you about her clinical uh, experience. So Bianca, if you could come up here. Is, oh, you know what? Thanks to COVID-19, I forgot how oh, this is done. We're doing it through via video. <laughs> yeah, that was a kid. All right, okay. Here, <laughs> Good evening, students, faculty, family, and friends. My name is Bianca Schmidt, and I'm honored to be speaking to you this evening. I'd first like to thank the School of Nursing for allowing me to share my thoughts on your upcoming clinical adventures. I'm an alternate entry master's student in my second year of the Adult Geriatric Clinical Nurse Specialist, or AGCNS, track. I'm very proud to now hold the title of registered nurse and truly can't express the pride I feel for you and your journey. It's hard to believe only a year has passed since I was in your shoes. Granted, I hadn't yet been well-versed in using Zoom and fully incorporated wearing masks, except for on Halloween, but I remember the pride I felt wearing my hand-me-down white coat, excited and ready to finally start clinicals. I'd be lying to you though if I didn't tell you I was nervous. I'm a rock climber and I found that it was even more daunting for me to knock on my first patient's door than it was to climb a 1,000 foot cliff face. But at the advice of a lead student that spoke last year to my cohort, I took a deep breath and knocked on that door and introduced myself. You may also be feeling nervous or you may have practiced working in a clinical setting but have yet to use the nursing thought process. Either way, you've got this and we're all here to support you. I'd first like to paint you a picture of what a nursing school clinical experience is really like. You'll start off visiting your clinical site a day before to pick out the right patient for you and collect all of the needed information on that patient and brush up on or research anything you don't yet know. The next day, you must be dressed and in place at 6.30 a.m. sharp, if not earlier. We're talking clean scrubs, ID badge, stethoscope, pen, sharpie, pen light, scissors, clipboard, notes, and a backup pen. You've done everything you can to prepare, but you still have to knock on that patient's door and introduce yourself as their student nurse. Your patient and family behind that door simply want a nurse who will listen to them, advocate for them, and be compassionate. These are all skills you've learned in your previous lives and will be crucial to your job as a nurse. Sure, you'll need to know the theory and pathology you're learning in adult health, but that knowledge is put to better use when coupled with a caring and compassionate nurse. While keeping all this in mind, I'd like to share some things with you that helped me throughout my clinical experience. Something I can't stress enough is that this is an opportunity to practice, learn, and grow. It's important to have grace with yourself as you figure out your rhythm and learn how to make decisions under pressure. Before I started my clinicals, I made a point to forgive myself for not being perfect right off the bat. As nursing students, we often want perfection in our grades and in everything that we do, but it's okay to not be perfect right away. We often learn better from our mistakes anyway, as long as you pick yourself up and try again. Remember, safety is the most important thing and your clinical instructors will be there to help you do the right thing. From my own experience, I can say with confidence that I will never forget the time I grabbed a six milliliter syringe to administer four milliliters of medication to a patient that had a central line. If you haven't already learned, it's very important to use a 10 milliliter syringe when using a central line because of the pressure of the smaller syringe would risk rupture in that central line. Um, but my clinical instructor, she looked at my supplies and said, what's wrong with this picture? It felt like an eternity of me racking my brain trying to figure out what she was talking about. I was looking at all my supplies, explaining the rationale behind all of them. Then she picked up the syringe and it finally clicked. I couldn't use a six milliliter syringe, but instead of beating myself up and shutting down in that moment, I picked myself up and went to the supply closet and got that 10 milliliter syringe. And then we talked about that rationale. My clinical instructor intervened and didn't let me put my patient at risk. And now I'm always gonna be grabbing 10 mil syringes for my patients with central lines. These kinds of experiences will help you grow as a nurse and should build you up as long as you remember to learn, grow, move forward, and try again. Another key to success is making connections with the people around you. Find something in common with your patient to bond over. You're not talking to Johnny O'Dell, the mannequin, this time. These patients actually have a story and interests and opinions. Get to know them a little bit. 
I remember one of my patients and her sister were huge UT fans. They had a Longhorn shirt, Longhorn tumblers, even their keychains had the recognizable burnt orange. Believe it or not, she even complimented my creamsicle UT nursing scrubs. We talked about her and the patient's history with UT and really bonded over that. By the time my day was coming to an end and I was doing my last rounds and saying goodbye, they made a point to tell me how thankful they were for my help. I didn't think I'd done much. I just administered medications, took vitals, and did a head-to-toe assessment. But I had done so much more. I made them feel human and made sure they were comfortable and felt taken care of. You have this privilege of being with patients at their most vulnerable, where a little bit of care goes such a long way. In addition to connecting with your patients, you should also connect with your nurses. These are some of the best resources for you to learn from. Having a good relationship with them will not only open opportunities for you to practice more skills, but will help asking them questions a lot easier. A nurse I got along with well in one of my pediatric rotations went out and found me so that I could insert a suprapubic straight catheter on a patient that I wasn't even assigned to. That sort of practice doesn't always turn up, so it was pretty cool for me. I also got to practice starting new IVs in nearly every new patient in the ER because that trust I had built with the nurse I was assigned to. And you're not only working with nurses, you'll interact with physicians, speech and language therapists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and patient care technicians or PCTs. Ask them questions about their specialty, learn from their experience. I even kept still keep in touch with the PCT I worked with. We shared stories and bonded and he ended up being a great person for me to go to and ask questions about where I could find supplies and how I could reach out. Um, and now I reach out to him for restaurant recommendations. Having these good relationships with the people around you will not only make your experience better, but having a good support team to learn from and lean on is invaluable. Lastly, you should take every opportunity that's given to you. A patient down the hall needs an IV? Just ask if you can start it. Your nurse offers for you to insert a Foley catheter? Do it. The best way to learn is just to try it. I remember my favorite day in labor and delivery clinical rotation was in postpartum when my nurse offered me to give these two newborns their very first baths. It was some of the sweetest moments I've ever had. And earlier that day, my nurse helped me or asked me to help her um, soothe all the babies while they got their heel stick blood tests. I can't tell you how cute it was to have these little babies suckling on my pinky, gloved pinky. <laughs> I also gave discharge instructions that day with my clinical teaching assistant. But after taking all these clinical opportunities, I didn't finish all of my paperwork. So I learned a little bit about time management that day. But really practicing nursing care beyond that paperwork is invaluable. Though there will always be paperwork and documentation to do, so it's important to learn to do those during your downtime as well. But ask for opportunities and take them when they're given to you. Offer help and remember to ask for help when you need it. Overall, you're well equipped to be going into your clinical rotations. You've spent the last few months studying, oftentimes from home, and probably losing some sleep. Nursing school is about to pick up as you shift into this next stage. Family and friends, believe it or not, your nursing student's gonna need even more time and space to study and dedicate to school. They're about to get a lot busier, so keep cheering them on. Students, remember to thank your family and friends for their support throughout your time in school when you get the chance. They're most likely taking on a lot while you're going to school. And recognize that your faculty is also here for you and wants you to succeed almost as much as you do. Remember, give yourself grace as you evolve into a nurse. Make those connections and take on clinical opportunities that come your way. First, you've got a knock on your patient's door. Hook them. <laughs> So, um, I believe after words, we'll have the actual video of Bianca, uh, so you won't see her stunt double, but I uh, hope <laughs> so you are able to get the message from her. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's, uh, that's it. Right, I'm going to use this one so I don't. Thank y'all for your turn. Hello, everyone. It's nice to see y'all again. I haven't seen everybody in a few weeks, so this is great. So I am going to walk you through the Nightingale Pledge, which is our pledge to take care of our patients with compassionate care 
you have a copy on your table, so if you will read it with me, please. Okay. I pledge in the presence of this assembly to honorably practice my profession of nursing. I pledge to be the best nurse I can be by applying evidence-based practice, engaging in lifelong learning, collaborating with my colleagues, and educating those in my care. I will do these things remembering quality patient care is my main priority. I pledge to communicate effectively with my patients and colleagues and to promote teamwork in order to provide optimal care. I pledge to always remember my patients are not just patients. They are people just like me. I pledge to be an advocate for my patients in the most tumultuous times of their lives. I will practice patient and family-centered care, and I will make time to listen to my patients' fears and stories. I pledge to practice with integrity. I realize that nursing is not simply a discipline. It is an art, a science, and a way of life. Caring is at the center of my being, and I will exude it in all interactions. I pledge to do all of these things remembering that I make a difference in the lives of my patients every day. Such powerful words. I love that pledge. So we are going to move on to the pinning portion of our ceremony. And so that we can have everyone up on camera, we're going to do it in small batches. I'll read your name in groups of three and socially distance. Please come up, bring your pin with you so that you can pin yourself, and then you'll return to your seat, and I'll call the next group up. All right, so we will start with Renata Aguirre Mejides, Mijares, excuse me, Aya Akid, and Olufukayu Akiyemi. I want to be kind of in the center here so it's going to be on the camera. You can pin yourself. Yeah. You can pin yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Put them on. Oh, <laughs> Ashley Arsenault, Jordan Benavides, and Teresa Burt. <laughs> Natalie Vogue, Kimberly Borker, and Aaron Brown. I'm going to help. Jessica Buchler, Alyssa Carver, and Lucy Chisholm. <laughs> Peter Clowder. Paige Coleman, and Pragati Desai. Dyer, Vernon Edmondson, and Robert Egertson.
Amanda Franklin, Alexandra Gabbing, and Alyssa, Annalisa, excuse me, Gonzalez. Monica Gonzalez, Kevin Goodlett, Erica Greathouse. <laughs> Carlos Hernandez, Amy Hodges, and Sigo Brian Hong. So who, excuse me. <laughs> Tara Horsfield, Brianna Huvera, and Evelyn Klein Robenhardt. McKay Kyle, Patricia Lincoln, and Ashley Lopez Moran. Ingrid Mason, and Lauren McGettrick. Christina Nguyen, and Hong Nung Nguyen. <laughs> Kathleen O'Brien, Catherine Owen, and Victoria Pacifico. Jennifer Pruitt, and Megan Romano. <laughs> Rachel Schroer, Sydney Schutze, and Brian Scott. Lila Tenenbaum, Jessica Thomas. <laughs> Jonathan Walkman, Julie Welch, and Thalen Wells.
And the last group will do four, so no one has to stand up here by themselves. <laughs> Erica Williams, Hannah Yerby, Crystal Zabaleta, and Leah Zimor. <laughs> Congratulations, future nurses. Okay. So at this time, I'd like to thank Ms. Rita Nunez and Ms. Sean White, who's been helping us promote this event online as well as offline. Um, uh, this is the first time that we've done it uh, this way. And, uh, and so we're very happy to have your support. Finally, students, I want to congratulate you once more um, on your achievement. We are very proud of you. Uh, we know that you can represent your, yourself in the students that you are doing very well. I personally am very excited to have you out there as well. Actually, two of my kids uh, were delivered blind nurses, right? And I think in one of the instances we have a student nurse there as well. So uh, to know that you're out there serving our community and serving individuals um, in time with me uh, it makes us uh, very proud. And now more than ever, uh, we need uh, great quality nurses like you, long term nurses. So uh, go forward and practice competent, compassionate care. Congratulations.